Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov slash careers. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. Hi, I'm Scott Chesworth, and welcome to The Ancient World. Episode 4, The Pyramid Builders. Last time, we looked at the ancient Near East in the period between 2700 and 2000 BC and witnessed the formation of the world's first empires under Sargon of Akkad and the third dynasty of Ur. This week, let's travel to the south and look in on Egypt during the same period. Before we do, I also wanted to take this opportunity to invite listeners to visit the companion website, ancientworldpodcast.com, where you'll find links to images, maps, and photographs supplementing each episode. We last left Egypt unified and poised to build on the foundation laid by the rulers of its first two dynasties. Under the third through sixth dynasties, collectively known as the Old Kingdom, Egypt would not only embark upon an era of military domination of adjacent territories, but would also build its most awe-inspiring monuments. But I'm guessing you might already be reading ahead there. The third Egyptian dynasty began in 2650 with two brothers, Sanakte, or Nebka, who ruled for 18 years, and Zoser, who succeeded him. It's not entirely clear why this succession represents a new dynasty, since both brothers were apparently sons of Kasakemwe, the last ruler of the previous dynasty, but far be it from me to argue with Manetho. Anyway, Zoser earned the distinction of being the first Egyptian ruler to dispatch military expeditions to the Sinai Peninsula, which was important to the early Egyptians for its wealth of valuable minerals, particularly turquoise and copper, and for its use as a buffer zone between the Nile Valley and the early civilizations of the Near East. Inscriptions from this period found in Sinai show the banner of Seth alongside symbols of Horus, indicating that Zoser was continuing his father's program to reconcile the opposing power centers of Upper and Lower Egypt. Zoser also extended the borders of Egypt as far south as Aswan, the first cataract of the Nile, and later the official southern boundary of Egypt. Just so you know, since they come up all the time in discussing Egypt, cataracts are shallow lengths of whitewater rapids where large ships cannot effectively pass, and therefore constitute natural borders to the projection of Egyptian power. The ability to extend Egyptian domination to this or that cataract would often become the measure of a regime's strength in years to come. Military accomplishments notwithstanding, Zoser's most influential legacy was in the realm of monumental construction. The tombs of officials from previous dynasties lined the edge of the plateau at Saqqara near the capital of Memphis, and were built in the Mastaba, Arabic for bench, style low, flat, and rectangular. Zoser decided to forego the kingly tradition of building his tomb at Abydos, and chose to build at Saqqara as well. He also decided to move his funeral monument back from the escarpment edge by about a mile, and there, in 2630 BC, constructed a grandiose complex that was an architectural first, the famous Step Pyramid of Saqqara. This complex, recognized as the first monumental building in the world constructed entirely of stone, was the brainchild of Imhotep, Zoser's vizier, treasurer, administrator, and high priest, as well as architect, and whose power and prestige in Egypt was second only to Zoser's. The basic structure of the Step Pyramid consists of six mastabas, 
each smaller in size and placed atop one another, making a series of unequal steps rising over 200 feet. Close to the entrance of the complex is a box-like structure with a pair of small holes for viewing. Within this structure was a painted, life-size, seated figure of Zoser, the oldest such royal sculpture known in Egypt. The construction of the Step Pyramid tells us a few things about Egypt under Zoser's rule. That he was able to mobilize a large workforce to execute a massive project on a relatively short 20-year schedule and that Egyptian government during this period was sufficiently stable and organized to direct the work and feed the workers. Zoser's funeral complex stands at the head of a long line of Egyptian stone architecture. Within it, many later building forms and styles can be seen, admittedly in an experimental stage, that would be copied and refined over the next 2,000 years. At first glance, and sometimes even at second, the Step Pyramid of Zoser bears a strong resemblance to the ziggurat-style temples of ancient Sumer. Since I didn't get around to discussing ziggurats last time, this seems as good a time as any. While temples were present in Sumerian cities as early as 5300 BC, the ziggurat style was not used until the Third Dynasty of Ur in roughly 2100 BC. One of the most famous ziggurats, and possibly the first, was the one built by Ur-Namu and dedicated to the moon god Nana, the patron deity of Ur. This puts the Sumerians roughly 500 years behind the Egyptians in the construction of such stepped profile monuments. Scratch the surface, literally, and other major differences come to light. While the ziggurats of Sumer were built of mud brick, the first Egyptian pyramids were built entirely of far more durable stone reflecting differences in the resources available in each region. The two structures also served entirely different purposes in their respective cultures. Sumerian ziggurats were religious structures, considered to be the dwelling place of each city's patron god, and were typically part of a larger temple complex including a courtyard, storage rooms, and living areas. Ziggurats also served as high places for priests to retreat to in the face of rising floodwaters, as well as an easily secured location, due to limited access points, where priests could perform ritual sacrifices in seclusion. In contrast, Egyptian pyramids were exclusively funereal in purpose, underlining once again the importance of the afterlife in their culture. In addition to being the first Egyptian pyramid builder, it was also in Zoser's time that Egyptian artwork first began to depict the king in the formal regalia that he would wear over the next few thousand years. The cobra-like Nemes headdress, the false beard, and the ornate kilt. Another fixture of later Egyptian culture, the civil service, which was essentially an extension of the royal household, had also formed by this period. The highest official was the vizier, who supervised the collection of taxes and the administration of justice. Below the vizier was a staff of chancellors, quartermasters, and scribes. For local government, Egypt was divided into provinces called gnomes, under governors, nomarchs, from noble or royal families. Sekemket, Zoser's successor, apparently engaged in a failed attempt to construct his own step pyramid that went one step higher, but died before its completion and left its unfinished remains to be buried in the desert. The final two Third Dynasty rulers, Kaba and Huni, also made attempts at pyramid construction. Kaba built his near Giza, while Huni constructed his at Maidum on the edge of the Fayum Oasis, 50 miles south of modern Cairo. Huni's pyramid, intended to be the first geometrically true pyramid, serves as the prototype for the standard layout of a pyramid complex. A pyramid with north-facing access through a descending passage to a burial chamber located in the bedrock or at ground surface within the pyramid mass, a small pyramid serving as a mortuary temple to the east, and a causeway extending from the mortuary temple to the edge of cultivation, where a second small valley temple is located. Huni, 
who apparently ascended to the throne from a position as high official in Zoser's court, was also known for establishing a fortress on the island of Elephantine in Aswan to secure Egypt's southern border at the First Cataract. He also built a small ceremonial pyramid at Elephantine whose purpose is unknown. The fourth dynasty was founded by Snefru, who married Huni's daughter. During his reign, Snefru led several military expeditions beyond the established borders of Egypt. From Lebanon, he obtained the cedar logs needed to build temple doors and great ships. From Libya and Nubia, he captured slaves for his construction projects, as well as cattle to feed his large labor force. He also continued to exploit the mineral wealth of Sinai, as his predecessors had done. Snefru continued the development of pyramid architecture through two projects, both constructed at the new site of Dashur, around 20 miles south of modern Cairo. The first effort is known as the Bent Pyramid, and has the curious feature of a radical reduction in the angle of the sides about halfway to the summit, possibly implying some sort of building disaster during construction. Either way, it looks pretty janky. So, not to be daunted, Snefru tried, tried again. His second attempt, far more successful, resulted in the creation of the Red Pyramid, the first true Egyptian pyramid, and the prototype, with a minor change in the angle of the sides, for all subsequent pyramid construction. Snefru's son Khufu, or Cheops, inherited a strong and consolidated kingdom with enormous resources and manpower at his command. So when it came to his funeral monument, Khufu went big. I mean really big. I mean seven wonders of the ancient world and only one still standing today big. Of course, I'm talking about the Great Pyramid. Constructed in 2550 BC of around 2,300,000 stone blocks, each averaging about two and a half tons in weight, the pyramid arose, and still rises, 480 feet over the Giza Plateau, southwest of modern Cairo. In case your mind isn't already blown, how about this? The Great Pyramid stood as the tallest man-made building in the world for the next four and a half thousand years. For you trivia buffs, its height was finally exceeded by Lincoln Cathedral in England in 1311 AD, although in my mind that building kind of cheated by including a spire. Also, even to this day, we do not know exactly how the Great Pyramid was built. Khufu was succeeded by his sons Jedefre and Khafre, or Sephron, the latter of whom constructed the Second Pyramid at Giza, as well as the Great Sphinx. The Sphinx was apparently carved from an outcrop of limestone rock left after the quarrying of blocks for the nearby Great Pyramid. The Giza necropolis was completed by Khafre's son Menkaure, or Mycerinius, who built the third and smallest pyramid, perhaps indicative of internal political problems during his reign, or possibly reflecting the period's cultural shift from ruler worship to a more general worship of the sun god Ra. The final fourth dynasty ruler was Shepseskaf, and the unremarkable mortuary temple he left at Saqqara is further indication of the declining fortunes of the fourth dynasty after the lofty heights of Khufu's reign. Userkaf, the first fifth dynasty ruler, took power around 2500 BC and erected the first Egyptian sun temple, containing a stubby obelisk that was forerunner to the far loftier versions raised centuries later during the Egyptian New Kingdom. His son and successor, Sahure, is credited with establishing an Egyptian navy, sending a fleet to Punt, modern Somalia, and trading with the early cultures of the eastern Mediterranean. His pyramid, constructed in Abu Sir, north of Saqqara, featured colonnaded courts, relief sculptures depicting his fleet, and inscriptions recording his military campaigns against the Libyans of the western desert. The reign of Sahure's son and successor, Neferer Kare, was unusual for the significant number of surviving records describing him as a kind and gentle ruler. The fifth dynasty continued on through several more fairly unremarkable rulers before finally ending with Unas, who left behind no sons. The sixth dynasty was founded by Teti, 
who married Unus's daughter Iput. Teti's son by Iput, named Pepi I, was slated to succeed him, but Userkare, Teti's other son by Queen Kuit, apparently wasn't too keen on that plan. Userkare decided to resolve the succession question preemptively by leading a conspiracy against his father that culminated with Teti's murder by his own bodyguards and Userkare's ascension to the throne. Over the next few years, Pepi worked to rally the support of powerful nobles in Upper Egypt and finally got the backing he needed to overthrow his usurping brother. Unfortunately, as payment for their support, these nobles demanded greater autonomy for the nomarchs, local rulers, of their region, an arrangement that would come back to haunt Pepi's six dynasty successors. This devolution of power to the provinces, at the expense of the central authority of Memphis, is considered the beginning of the decline of the old kingdom. On the bright side, Pepi I was a prolific builder who oversaw extensive construction projects at Dendara, Abydos, Elephantine, and Neken. However, it probably didn't go unnoticed that these sites were all located in Upper Egypt, the home of his nomarch allies. Pepi I was succeeded by Merenre and then Pepi II, who came to power at age 6 and ruled until he was 94, making him not just the longest ruling Egyptian king, but the longest reigning king of any time or place period. Pepi II's long rule was characterized by continued trade with Lebanon and Nubia, and by the ever-increasing wealth and influence of nobles outside the royal court. The nomarchs of Upper Egypt, in particular, began raiding each other's territories and building their own elaborate funeral monuments, all reflecting a general breakdown of central authority. With the fall of the 6th dynasty on the death of Pepi II around 2200 BC, the Egyptian Old Kingdom came to an end. The 700 years between the pyramid builders of the Old Kingdom and the equally radiant dynasties of the New Kingdom is divided into three distinct periods, the First Intermediate Period, the Middle Kingdom, and the Second Intermediate Period. During the First Intermediate Period, which contains the 7th through 10th ruling dynasties, Egyptian central government broke down completely. In addition to the influence of powerful nobles, this is also likely due to the Nile having entered a period of low flooding and resulting famine. As discussed previously, this may be the same regional drought that helped bring about the collapse of the old Akkadian Empire at roughly the same time. The records of rulers and events during the first intermediate period are often sparse and conflicted. While the successors of Pepi II likely continued to rule in Memphis, they appeared to control a little beyond the city and its immediate surrounds. The Nile Delta fell under the control of unspecified Asiatics from the east. Local nomarchs and warlords jockeyed for power elsewhere, sometimes extending dominion over large swaths of territory, other times dividing rule between rival dynasties in different regions. Two primary competing regions were Heracleopolis in Middle Egypt and Thebes, modern Luxor, in Upper Egypt, and their forces often clashed near Abydos. Egypt would finally be reunited under King Mentuhotep, founder of the 11th Egyptian dynasty, but we'll save his story for another time. Farther to the east during the same period, a complex culture was also rising in the river valleys of ancient Pakistan. The regional civilization first emerged in the Indus River Valley, and only later in the Ganges River Valley. Both were fertile areas watered by snowmelt from mountains, but the broad floodplain of the Indus allowed for extensive irrigation, leading to the development of a well-organized society fed by agricultural surpluses. You're probably familiar with the general scenario by now. The geography of the Indus Valley put the civilization that arose there in a similar situation to Egypt, with rich agricultural lands surrounded by geographic buffers of highlands, desert, and ocean, inhibiting foreign invasion. But also like Egypt, the Indus was close enough to the Middle East to engage in trade with the civilizations of early Mesopotamia. By 2500 BC, 
Cities that rivaled the great urban centers of Sumer were developing along the Indus River and its tributaries. At least three cities in the region had populations of 30 to 40,000, making them comparable with the largest cities in Mesopotamia. The most important were Mohenjo-Daro on the lower Indus River and Harappa on the Ravi River near the upper end of the Indus River Valley. This civilization is often referred to as the Harappan Civilization, since Harappa was the first city to be excavated in modern times. It is also called the Indus Valley Civilization, or just abbreviated IVC. In addition to dozens, perhaps hundreds, of towns and villages throughout Pakistan, scattered IVC settlements have also been found in eastern Afghanistan, Bahrain, eastern Iran, western India, and even as far afield as Turkmenistan. At its peak, the IVC may have had a population of well over 5 million. The IVC was rediscovered somewhat accidentally in 1856 by British railway engineers. In their search for ballast to use in construction, they heard rumors of an ancient city in the area and came across many hard, well-burnt bricks ideal for their purposes. They reduced the first such unnamed city they found almost entirely for this purpose, and also used many bricks from Harappa, the next nearby city they discovered, before finally stopping either because they had all the bricks they needed, or maybe because they finally got a clue that they were doing something really, really stupid. All in all, bricks from these two ancient cities currently provide ballast along 93 miles of railroad track running between Karachi and Lahore. Both Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro were built on a similar plan, with a gridwork of streets, standardized housing for the common people, and larger residences for the elite. The advanced public architecture of the Harappans is reflected in their impressive dockyards, granaries, warehouses, public buildings constructed on large brick platforms, and massive protective walls, these last two affording them some protection from frequent floods. Somewhat unusually for an ancient civilization, there is no conclusive evidence for the construction of either palaces or temples or, for that matter, of kings, armies, or priests. Although there are enough religious figurines to imply at least some degree of priestly influence. Unfortunately, many aspects of this important early civilization are still a mystery. The IVC also boasted the world's earliest known urban sanitation system, which included bathrooms linked to underground sewers, an important contribution to public health in cities of 40,000 people. The ancient sewers and drainage systems were far more advanced than those of contemporary urban sites in Mesopotamia, and, sad to say, even more efficient than those used in many areas of Pakistan and India today. Such large-scale development projects imply a complex society where leaders commanded the labor of thousands under the guidance of engineers and other officials. As with other ancient civilizations, it's likely that grain surpluses supported the leadership and associated bureaucracy and the development of skilled trades. Harappan civilization was mostly built on trade, binding its cities to one another and the region as a whole to Mesopotamia and even more distant lands. Extensive caravan networks spread across much of Central Asia and the Persian Plateau. Harappan trading ships hugged the coasts of the Arabian Sea, bearing trade goods to Ur and other Sumerian cities, often using middlemen in Dilmun, modern Bahrain, as well as possibly to Egypt, East Africa, and even Crete. Harappan merchants used distinctive seals to mark their goods, often depicting animals native to India, such as the elephant and rhinoceros, along with other mythical animals. Some seals also used more abstract symbols, the only evidence of a possible written language making its way down to us. Nearly 400 different characters have been identified, but all have so far resisted translation. The absence of royal palaces and the large numbers of religious figurines found at both Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro suggest a theocratic state of priests, merchants, and farmers. Harappan religion centered around fertility, 
including the worship of a mother goddess as well as certain trees, especially the people, anticipating their sacred status in later Hindu and Buddhist traditions. These factors, along with shared beliefs in the sacredness of cows and the ritual purification properties of rivers, suggest that Hinduism may have its earliest roots in the Indus Valley civilization. In terms of science, the Harappans achieved great accuracy in the measurement of length, mass, and time, and were among the first civilizations to develop a uniform system of weights and measures. Their smallest division of length, equivalent to around 2 millimeters, is the smallest ever recorded from the Bronze Age. The engineering skill of the Harappans was remarkable, especially in their construction of docks, which reflect a careful study of tides, waves, and currents. They also developed new techniques in metallurgy and handicrafts, produced copper, bronze, lead, and tin, and may have been the first to use wheeled transport. Their only possible competitor there is the Sumerians, which puts them in pretty good company either way. There's also evidence that the Harappans practiced an early form of dentistry, and I think we're just not going to dwell on that one since I'm already kind of cringing at the thought. Like other river valleys that fostered ancient civilizations, the Indus region was subject to seasonal flooding. This flooding served to nourish the fields, but could also sometimes be catastrophic to local construction. The city of Mohenjo-Daro had to be rebuilt at least nine times, and ruinous floods, as well as the drying up of the important Saraswati River, which supported much of the region's agriculture, may have contributed to the final decline of Harappan civilization after around 2000 BC. Over the next few hundred years, the area remained productive, but major cities were abandoned and long-distance trade withered, awaiting the region's next stage of cultural development with the arrival of the Aryan civilization from the north. But that's a story for another podcast. Now let's travel even further to the east, to another region of the world we have not yet visited, and discuss the culture that rose in the 22nd century BC along the Yellow River in ancient China. Much like the early civilizations of the Americas, early Chinese civilization developed in relative isolation, separated from the emergent cultures of the Near East and India by mountains, deserts, and oceans. They called their realm the Middle Kingdom, not to be confused with the Egyptian Middle Kingdom, which we'll be discussing next episode, and considered it to be a land of order and stability surrounded by wilderness and chaos. The seeds of Chinese civilization were planted by 5000 BC, by which time people were living in villages along the Middle Yellow River and its tributaries and practicing terraced farming. The Yellow River was named for the yellow loss, or silt, deposited along its banks by winds from the Gobi Desert. This loss provided fertile soil for the cultivation of millet, a local cereal crop. At around the same time, in the wetlands along the Yangtze River to the south, villagers began cultivating rice. It was in the floodplain of the Yellow River, downriver from its first settlements, that people first banded together under strong leadership to dig ditches and drainage canals for irrigation and flood control. Chinese annals credit a legendary ruler named Yu the Great of the Xia clan with finally taming the floodplain in the late 22nd century BC, marking the customary beginning of Chinese civilization. According to ancient Chinese texts, Gun, the father of Yu, had previously spent nine years attempting to control the flooding of the rivers through a system of dikes and dams along the riverbanks, but his work was considered a failure because the floods became stronger. The local king at the time was Shun, supposedly one of the semi-mythical five emperors of ancient China, all of whom were legendary sages of great moral character. Gun himself was supposedly the son of Xuan Su, another of the five emperors. Despite their respective pedigrees, Shun had Gun executed for his failure, and Gun's son, Yu, was appointed to finish his father's work. After careful study of the problem, Yu decided to use a different approach. He convinced local tribes to help him build a network of irrigation canals, which relieved floodwaters into fields, 
and also perform dredging on riverbeds to help them flow more freely out to sea. According to legend, he labored on this project for 13 years without once going home, taken as symbolic of his extreme devotion and perseverance. Yu spent most of his time personally assisting in the work, as well as eating and sleeping with the common laborers. Over time, other tribes became inspired by his example and joined in his efforts. At the end of 13 years, Yu was finally successful in stopping the floods, a milestone event memorialized in Chinese history as Great Yu Controls the Waters. The flooding protection provided by the canal system increased the produce from farming, as well as the Xia tribe's influence, and Yu soon became leader of the local tribes. With the growth of agriculture came increased population, the ability to store and redistribute crops, and the potential to support specialized craftsmen and administrators. In other words, the standard hallmarks of a budding civilization. Soon after these developments, King Shun, the same ruler who had executed Yu's father for failure, sent Yu to lead an army to suppress the San Mao tribe, who were harassing other client tribes living near the boundaries of his kingdom. Yu's success in defeating the San Mao further strengthened the Xia tribe's power and prestige. Shun, who was getting old, eventually decided to abdicate in favor of Yu, marking the beginning of the Xia dynasty. Upon ascending the throne, at the age of 53, Yu founded a new capital at Anyi and divided his kingdom up into nine provinces. Using bronze provided as tribute from these nine territories, he supposedly created nine tripod cauldrons, which were used to offer ritual sacrifices to the ancestors. Under the subsequent Shang dynasty, these nine cauldrons were used on ceremonial state occasions to symbolize and reinforce the ruler's authority. Yu ruled the Xia dynasty for 45 years before finally succumbing to an illness during a hunting trip to the eastern frontier of his kingdom, and was supposedly buried there. Upon his death, Yu passed power to his son Qi, setting the precedent for dynastic rule. The Xia dynasty, between 2070 and 1600 BC, is the first dynasty to be described in ancient historical records, but there are doubts as to whether this dynasty actually existed. Archaeological evidence from the period includes a bronze smelter from around 2000 BC unearthed at Erli Tu in central Henan province. The smelter has alternately been associated with either the Xia dynasty or the early stages of their successors, the Shang. Erli Tu was known to be home to the largest settlement anywhere in East Asia until around 1500 BC, and was also clearly a royal center of some importance, containing two palace complexes. But again, it's unclear whether this city serviced the Xia or Shang. In addition, early markings from this period found on pottery and shells, again, either of Xia or early Shang origin, are believed to be ancestral to modern Chinese characters. So it's pretty evident that during this time, important advancements were being made in the development of Chinese civilization. Unfortunately, the general dearth of archaeological finds and clear written records means that this era of Chinese history is still poorly understood. Fortunately, the next ruling dynasty, the Shang, is far better documented. But we'll discuss that dynasty in a later podcast. In the first four episodes of this series, I have attempted to provide a broad survey of ancient civilizations across the globe from the beginning of recorded human history down through around 2000 BC. Next week, we'll dive into the tumultuous period between 2000 and 1500 BC. We'll see Egypt rise anew under the Middle Kingdom, only to find itself conquered by foreign invaders for the first time in the country's long history. We'll see the legendary city of Babylon sacked by Hittite invaders from the north. And, perhaps most tragically, we'll watch the Minoans, at the very apex of their golden age, suddenly fall victim to one of the largest volcanic eruptions of all time, so powerful that it may have given birth to the legend of Atlantis. Next time on The Ancient World. <laughs>